All right, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. We're gonna get started here. I know some folks will continue to, to roll in. Uh, that's fine, uh, please find a seat and uh, we'll get started. Uh, I'm just gonna speak a little logistically. Uh, first, thank you for uh, a very pleasant day so far. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, as far as uh, feedback, again, we put the feedback QR code, the survey code in your bag. Hopefully, uh, even with this session, uh, you can fill out that survey provide the feedback to Ken uh, for his session. And really, one of, just last two items, uh, if you have not filled out your sponsor card or you filled it out and haven't figured out where to place it, the box is right outside of this door. Uh, it's a blue and white polka dot, I believe, box uh, with a sign. Please put it in there, because uh, after this, we'll be taking that box downstairs to the, con con uh, the retrospective and happy hour, which is just down the stairs to your right in the performance hall. So immediately after uh, this uh, session ends, go down there, uh, they'll be handing out a drink token to each uh, conference attendee as you go into the event. Um, and we'll start there. So hopefully everybody can join us down there for the retrospective and happy hour. We do ask, you know, we haven't had a, really a survey as it relates to the overall conference as opposed to the actual sessions. Uh, there's, a, there's a banner downstairs, there's large post-it notes. If you could put any feedback, positive, negative, doesn't particularly matter, any feedback is welcomed to help us improve the conference next year. This is our first year at this facility. I don't know if Elaine is here. Is Elaine in here? Who's helped us? But how about a round of applause for the Ohio Union folks? Thank you. Our first year, we, we have some ideas on what we think we could do better, but it's always best to hear from you guys on how we can improve the conference. So please do feel free to provide that feedback when you go downstairs, put it up on the retrospective banner. We'll collect that information by the end of the night. Make sure we report back to you. Uh, so without further ado, I actually want to introduce Chuck Suschek, uh, who's going to do our introductions of our closing keynote. Yep. A good speaker has to have a great introduction. So I'll try and give you one here. I'm Chuck Suschek, and I'd like to introduce Ken Schwaber. If you haven't heard of him, you've been living under a rock. That's all there is to it. With Jeff Sutherland, he invented Scrum in the late 1990s. He's a signature of the Agile Manifesto. He founded Scrum Alliance, Agile Alliance, and Scrum.org. He told me just recently he finds things. That was a joke. He's a genius. That's all there is to it. In fact, the first time I met him, I told my wife he must be an alien because he thinks so differently than, than I ever could have. Um, he's going to be talking about the next level of Agile and the direction of Scrum.org and how we can help organizations understand the value of their software. Ken. Thank you. Tell me if you can't hear me. It's okay? Good. So I want to talk with you a little bit today about that word which is so pervasive, agile. I mean, you hear it used in all sorts of contexts. Um, people do different things with us because they say it's in the name of agility. Back in, in 2001 at Snowbar, we got together and wrote down four sets of values that we thought were just critical to really care about deeply to build software in an effective way. It wasn't absolute, it just meant we would prefer to do that. And then we came up with some principles that were based on those values and came up with the word agile to represent those values and those principles. And that's agile. And started using it started working with companies on Scrum, Agile, and I've had the pleasure of working with many, many uh, fine teams of developers, um, organizations, who started becoming, um, just showing their excellence in developing really great products. And to me, this has been 13, 14 years of um, fruition of a lifetime of profession. Just the pl pleasure and the pride of seeing those people getting to do so well um, so we're going to talk a little about state of Agile. Um, is it still based on those values? Is it still reflecting those principles? 
or is the word kind of moved on to mean and be co-opted by and mean other things? And so we'll talk about that because it's a um, hard thing to get a grasp of, even for me. So I view the last decade as, for our profession and for a lot of people outside of it, as the Agile decade. I mean, it became from, from just a manifesto that everyone signed to um, a buzzword. Are you Agile? You know, I want to be Agile. Are you an Agilista? That sort of thing. Um, so where are we now regarding it? And, and there are very few facts. There are very few pieces of data which unequivocally tell us where we are with agility, where we are with using those values, using those principles, develop software in a way um, that helps our profession get better and helps our customers get more value from our work. Very, very little real data. Now, that does not mean there are no opinions. There is no shortage of opinions, and the advantage of opinions is you can have a long time at a bar talking about who's right. So that's one thing we bequeathed a profession that I just didn't consider. A lot of opinions about how Agile is doing. Um, so what I'm going to describe to you also is an approach to knowing how Agile is doing, to knowing the value that a software development group contributes to the organization so they know the value of doing it one way versus doing it the other way. My personal belief is the organizations, the teams that use the principles and the values of the Agile Manifesto will shine and outperform the others, but I am open to the possibility that water falls better. I won't be happy, but you know, it's never been measured, right? I say, well, you know, people doing waterfall, they're usually frowning and they're unhappy, um, but the ones doing scrum are often happy, or at least they smile when I come in. Might be because I'm bringing candy, I don't know. But those are opinions, those are, you know, pieces of information that's not data. So I want to look at how we could actually start basing the value um, of the software we develop based on you know, different ways of doing it so we can prove or disprove that Agile is really a good thing and people could stick to it or not. Right now, don't know. I have my opinions, so does everyone. So I don't know if you can remember back to 2001. When I, when I stopped and was thinking about this, it was like several centuries ago, right? I mean, there was year 2K. Remember the planes flying over the equator were supposed to turn upside down and fall to the earth? And everyone sank all sorts of money into it and almost nothing happened. But that was you know, a huge thing then. We had the last good operating system I used on, on an um, Intel computer, Windows XP, which was just you know, no longer service anymore, rats. Um, the iPod just came out. Um, Google search, we first um, Click-through ads were available on Google. CDMA was the technology used on cell phones, which is why you couldn't hear anything or do anything. Web 2.0 was a great new concept. We're going to be able to do commerce on the web. We'll probably be able to make over a billion dollars on online business and selling on the web. And it's like, oh, never, right? And um, the dot-com bubble, you know, it just, and so a lot of us were broke and living with our parents again. <sighs> And here we are, you know, 13 years later, and oh my God, we have NSA, you know, listening to this talk. <laughs> I think, who knows, <laughs> right? Um, we have Facebook, you know, where you can see things, what's going on, keep track of everyone. You have social networking, um, familiar with Stux Stuxnet, um, some government who's unknown to us, but certainly favors the West. Um, let loose a virus that found the software, the um, controllers in the centrifuges that were spinning the uranium in Iran and set them over spin and heat up and burn out. Wow, that's pretty clever. I hope they wasn't of any of me fine and finds my car and causes it to go off the road. I mean, this is pretty impressive use of technology. Um, mobile devices, we use them for everything. It's just amazing the things we do with it. Someone comes and says, hey, can I do a selfie with you? And I'm like, 
What? What? <laughs> um, almost all businesses now compete on the internet. Almost all businesses now use um, a software extensively for CRM, for workflow, for um, time to motion stuff. Businesses are run by software now. Certainly wasn't true in 2001. We're even now starting to get into where we can have chips in the barcodes so it's not just red, but probably you can track it when it goes to your house and you empty it and things like that. I mean, this is you know, creeping in everywhere. My, my car, I bought it to see what the quality control processes were. Um, it's a Volvo, it has 50 million lines of code. And it's funny, it's fun to watch all the different signals fight for the top of the queue in the signal bus on whether I'm going to be able to listen to the radio or not, or whether it's going to, it's... Um, and, and then now we're starting to get into driverless cars and tractors. You know, right out here, you'll see a large John Deere tractor that's able to look at the land, get the contours of the land, and do everything without a farmer inside it. Huh. That's in 13 years. And this is a tremendous explosion in technology, and all of this is based on the last scalable resource in the world, what you develop, software. So given that, I can't think of anything more critical than that you are able and you have an environment within which you can build the best software possible. It's no longer just, you know, well, the payroll didn't get out. It's like my heart monitor, <laughs> you know, whatever. So that's one decade. Um, our software is becoming critical to our society and to uh, all the businesses. We have our power grid, of course, run by software, but now it's starting to try to integrate in um, green technologies. That requires um, a type of technology to allocate power that's completely different and requires what's called smart grid technology, which is hugely significantly difficult to run and is going to change the entire um, landscape of power companies and water companies. Um, we have um, this new sorts of data being accumulated where you click on something and they suddenly know about your life and you get all these mails. I mean, this is incredible. And um, we also have this profoundly increased um, complex soft um, infrastructure of, what was it, in Florida, a commuter plane almost hit a drone when it was taking off? A drone? I mean, this is a very, very different world. And most of it, and it's being controlled through software and um, internet technologies from a place probably in Colorado Springs. Or if it was an enemy of that airline, probably right down below, but it's a different issue. So we're, I think when I was born, we had two billion, two and a half billion people you know, back in 1902. We're now up you know, in billions of people more. And the only way they can continue to interact and get more food and get power and work well together and interface and share is all founded on software. And guess who that is? It's us. So you would think that that would call for doing everything, everything possible to make it so you are as efficient and effective as possible. Good. I'm all for that. Um, so I, I view agility as the driver over the last 10 years. It wasn't that waterfall got better. Um, so things we saw, and this is again anecdotal, gathered from bunches of information, there's greater productivity per employee than there was 10 years ago. Peep organizations are able to get faster, mark products to market faster. And they're able to get products, I mean, we used to talk about releases that were nine months long. Now, my iPhone probably just got a couple of releases while I was standing here. You know, releases happen whenever they want and they update your software and, and geez, that's a phenomenal change. And also, we have an increased ability to innovate. So we have a surge of technology. We have a surge of supporting um, software like SDKs and the ability to build new things on that that support us and help us do things um, is incredible. This is not um, the world that I grew up in. Huge difference. 
Okay, so, so what is, given all that, if Agile helped this happen, and I'll make that assertion because I'm the one talking, and so I get to do that, um, made a lot of this happen, um, where is it now? How is it doing? How are things going? Um, and this is, um, I term this as an editorial because these are opinions. Um, I just reassert, there are no facts about this. Does anyone here have a fact about Agile and how it's doing? Hmm. Oh. So this is one way that people know Scrum and Agile. It's a line drawing with some circles in it. And when people see this, um, they're either baffled or they know that we're talking about Agile, right? So just a little line drawing. You see all sorts of variations of this. So that's one way of knowing Scrum and Agile. Another way is whenever you see, you know, once a day, a group of people gather in a circle and start talking to each other, you know that there's some sort of Agile event going on. So, you know, again, we have a clue that there's agility. Um, some people have found that agility is an excuse um, not to be abusive at the end of an entire release, but to do it daily or at the end of every sprint. <laughs> so we've actually turned um, what used to be called the death march at the end of a release to a death march hell every day. Um, not necessarily what was intended, but you know, so, sort of what happens. And then we found some people who bring drama um, to agility and, and cry and share. And um, none of this has too much to do with the principles and values of, of the Agile Manifesto, nor with actually just getting to work and delivering some good software. But these are often seen as signs of agility happening or something. <laughs> How other people know agility is it's a way, it's a way of introducing a pattern or rhythm of predictable things into an organization. So we're going to start developing, we're going to look at what we developed, we're going to talk about it. Um, other thing is it's a way of putting a cadence into the organization about software that didn't used to be there. And this cadence can often become, if it, if it becomes pretty solid in the organization, a heartbeat of delivery. And the delivery can be you know, weekly, it can be daily, it can be continuous, it can be whatever, but it adds a heartbeat of delivery into the organization that makes software development more predictable and more um, controllable. And this is the first step toward true agility. So this is how so many people know us. They have more visibility into what we're doing. And that's good. Um, other people in our industry know Scrum, know Agility, by the vast amount of money that they've been able to crank and out and make um, with the products they've been able to build and use in their companies. Um, Salesforce.com is a great example. Other companies like Microsoft, which just retrofitted its entire ALM tool suite using Scrum. Um, so you find companies that are able to create tremendous value using Scrum and Agile. And this goes back to the difference between 2001 and 2014. So I, I would see then that Agile has been a driver over the last years um, to business success. Unfortunately, that is not proven. That was Ken Schwaber's assertion at Koha. And it's not been quantified, it's not been proven. Um, some people, I was at a conference and I heard someone say that Agile was a fad. Um, and fads, are, our industry has 10-year fads and they tend to come and go. And it was, you know, structured methods and information engineering and object oriented, now Agile. And it's certainly time for a new fad because people are getting tired of that old one. So I, it was a fad. Um, there's certainly a money rush on. Um, everyone now wants to be you know, get some of the benefits that everyone else did. So everyone and his brother now sells you something that will make you more agile. Now, they may have nothing to do with the values and principles, but, you know, people have to make a living. So whatever. Unfortunately, with all of this, the values and the principles have been discarded. You do not find much evidence of them anymore at all. That's again an opinion based on working with a lot of places over the last, it's probably been five years I've seen the attrition.
And what I assert, kind of like an opinion, is that there's no correlation between the Agile values and the principles um, that it embodies and business value. So there's no reason for business to say, well, we need to stay with this because this created great value for us. All they know is we got together in circles, we yelled at each other, we hugged and cried and kissed, um, but you know, time for something else. There's no connection in the business's mind between this whole approach and them reaping great value. And in the absence of that, its persistence, its staying power is minimal. It is wide open to being a fad. Why not? You're starting to see um, this in most companies. If you get this tool, you're going to be more agile. And this talks about training, this talks about coaching, this talks about new types of reporting tools, new methodologies, all sorts of things. Um, even when I, when I came here, I'd heard about it before, but there's now something called DevOps. And, and they're fitting that into organizations now, too, because you can make money selling DevOps. Um, don't know what any of that has to do with agility. Matter of fact, it tends to unroad it because it feels formulaic and it feels like a process. Hmm. But that's me. I think I've talked with you in the past. I've been here for years. My daughter now lives in, outside Columbus, so I come here more often. Um, and I've been coming here for years, and I think every year we've gotten to look at a new Dilbert cartoon. And when Dilbert starts talking about us, you know, it's not a, the best thing in the world. And so this one, uh, we need more programmers. Use agile programming methods. Agile programming doesn't just mean doing more work with fewer people. Huh, find me something that works. So that I can, so that, so find me some work that do, words that do mean that and ask again. So he's just trying to get more work out of the people. He doesn't care what the words are. Hmm. That's some kind of missing, again, the values and the principles. But why would he care? Because he's not seeing value, business value, measurable, traceable, to agile ways of developing software. So I've, I've been consulting with a lot of organizations and still working with a number of them. And you know, we go through a fair amount of work and we do things that are difficult. And, and classically, the person who brought me in says at some point, so Ken, how are we doing? Not being a fool, I said, pretty good. Feels good. Look over there. Those people are smiling. Oh, it's the end of the day, right? <laughs> um, the, the problem is, you know, feels like from all the instances I've been in that they're getting better software out more frequently. They're working more closely with the customer, blah, 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 blah. But um, is this better than before? I don't know. Seems better for me. Seems like it's going in the right direction. But I don't have any facts to prove that. So he or she and I sit there and you know, talk about it a little, but we you know, have to persist because we feel it's right. So this is the bad news. Um, my opinion isn't worth a bucket of warm spit without direct evidence to back it up. Don't know, not quite sure about Ohio, but where I come from in Boston, a bucket of warm spit is not worth much unless it's a cold day in January. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would, I would um, contend that that's probably true of almost everyone in our industry. Um, I give it to Kent Beck, I give it to Martin Fowler, I give it to Ron Jeffries. Um, all the experts, we don't know. We might know that you're doing test-driven development better. We might know that the builds are working better. We might know all that. Um, but is that adding more business value? Is that a reason for the business to support us in continuing to do this stuff? No, it's not. It's just us doing our geek stuff, right? So what I'm going to propose is that rather than 
um, having a lot of opinions, maybe it's really important for us to start coming up with some evidence that what we're doing, and maybe and hopefully the way we're doing it with Agile adds value. Maybe it won't, but at least we'll know, right? And we can stand in one place and we can say, this is why we think this approach is the best one. And if someone comes along and says, well, you're really missing out on this, try it. We can see if it works better or not. Wow, that's kind of like building software, inspect and adapt and empiricism. Whole same thing. So evidence, wow, that's a neat type thing. Those of you that have watched Judge Judy and you know, the court dramas on TV are certainly you know, familiar with evidence. Um, it's an available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or, or invalid or not. So if we say Agile is better, we need some body of facts and information to show that it does create more value, it is better for the business than other approaches. Um, so it is anything that supports an assertion. The strongest type of evidence is, call, is called direct evidence. And it's a piece of evidence which is unambiguously proving a point. That is, it can't be interpreted in many other different ways. So for instance, if you see me spot a cockroach and step on it, you have some pretty good evidence right there. You saw it that Mr. Cockroach was me, right? If you walked over here later and you saw a cockroach crushed, and me walking off the stage, you would have some what's called circumstantial evidence that maybe I was involved in the demise of that cockroach, but it wouldn't stand up in court. You know, you'd say, I saw him walk off the stage and that cockroach was squashed, and I don't think I saw it squashed before, so it must have been him. That's called circumstantial evidence. Me walking off the stage, cockroach being there, could be interpreted many, many, many ways. So what we're looking for is not necessarily circumstantial evidence, which can be interpreted in many ways. We're looking for some hard facts which are unambiguous and unequivocal. Now, I wanted, um, I wanted some just short exercises about circumstantial versus direct evidence. And there was a case um, recently, this was in Gahana, where there was a, a spate of bird killings. And a number of cats were rounded up and brought into court and um, accused by the district attorney of having gone on a bird killing splurge. And I want to see whether you think um, this is evidence that is solid enough to put them away for 90 days or we just really have to release them. What, what do you think? Pardon? might have found it in the gutter. You know, the real killer cat was full and killed it and just left it there. This is just a cat who stumbled along and was bringing it into the police to turn in the other cat, right? <laughs> and its mother is deeply distressed that you have accused their beautiful little cat of doing this. This cat, is this a, is this a bird killer or just a, an ornithologist? <laughs> Hard to tell. Knowing the nature of cats, I tend to suspect that, you know, it's after a bird, but I don't have any conclusive proof. And don't bother me unless you have some pretty good solid evidence about this. Circumstantial or direct evidence? How many say direct? How many would hang this cat? Yeah, you know. The kids in the house were playing with one of those Indian play bonnets. Yeah, a cat got a feather, wandered off. Circumstantial. <laughs> we're, at, we're getting toward the boundary, I think. <laughs> now, I think, still think, this is just my belief, that it's circumstantial. The cat, known as Fuzzy, could have missed. But I think we do have direct evidence that that cat is stupid as anything. <laughs> that bird's bigger than you, you dumb cat. <laughs> 
So I would commit it to a cat asylum for you know, recovery of its hunting skills. I wouldn't necessarily put it in jail for killing you know, a very, very big, looks like an eagle to me. Now, this is um, useful to us um, when we say you know, our, our code coverage is up. And the business says, so? Um, yeah, but you know, we're decomposing our stories and they're ready more often. So, our velocity is better. You know, so, we, a lot of the things we talk about are not direct evidence of value to the business. They're just some circumstances about how we do our work. Now we can measure them, but there are a lot of things that can affect it. And we call those things, in our case, some trace evidence, Agile's fingerprints in the way we do our work. So for instance, we can know numbers about our own organization, facts, or we might know numbers about you know, other organizations and the industry. And I think I've asked to do this every year. Do you know how much money has been invested in your organization per person? In the absence of that, it's kind of hard to know to the business if they got a payback. Do we know what the return on investment's been? If you don't know the amount spent, then return on investment's another hard one. And has the organization's value gone up as a result of this? Again, you know, these are reasonable questions for um, a CEO to ask if they're investing in agility. Now, here's some other types of evidence which are more industry-based and used. Um, if I have the results of this assessment, you know, this is going through an organization and seeing how they do product ownership and how they do um, development and how the Scrum Master works. If I get this and I come up with a score for it, is this direct or circumstantial evidence of agility and value from agility? Circumstantial. We don't know why the person put down a four or a five or a three. We don't know what that meant. We don't know whether the team was representative at that time or not. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence is things which it could be interpreted in many different ways at many different times. And this is a point in time recording of a bunch of numbers and adding them up. Not direct evidence. Um, so here's some more. Here's a software dispersion graph. Over the last decade, the amount of software being built as agility has been going in. Is this direct evidence of the value of agility to the amount of software, or is this circumstantial? Why? Why is it circumstantial? My Volvo, it's, it's, it's circumstantial because you don't know what this is tracking. Matter of fact, the X and Y axis, I made them up about a week ago, <laughs> and I drew these lines because I thought they looked pretty, and then I thought I could get up at a conference and claim that they were proof, and you know, if this were another type of conference, I'd do that to you, but you know, I've been here before, I might come back, so <laughs> not gonna do that. Um, is this direct, this is done by a reputed organization, by Forrester, um, is this direct or um, circumstantial evidence that you can use Agile in the large in an organization to create value? It doesn't say anything about value. No, it doesn't. Matter of fact, the way this data was gotten was they said, do you, are you scaling if it's more than these number of teams? Not where, not how. I mean, the underlying data is just, it's, it's a person reporting to a survey. Do you love your wife? Yeah. That's anecdotal. <laughs> Oops. Um, this was an old one from Jerry Weinberg. And, and he's talking about the impact of task switching on projects. And he had done some measurements. Um, is this circumstantial or direct evidence of value to the business if you do task switch or don't task switch? It does talk about the amount you can focus on your work. 
doesn't mean you will focus on your work, doesn't mean it's the right work, doesn't mean you're not going to get interrupted doing other things. All it's saying is that task switching is detrimental to the um, ability to focus and create work. So nothing in there about the outcome to a business about this. So to me, if I'm a um, senior manager, I see no reason not to interrupt you because I don't see how it's going to hurt the business. Matter of fact, it's more convenient for me. Uh, this is an opinion. Um, what was intended as personal practices become a doctrine, and despite the mainstream adoption of Agile, the loss of its original intent has undermined its effectiveness. Wow, that's pretty bad. Is that a direct piece of evidence, a fact that we could rely on, or is that an opinion? I'd say it's an opinion. Might be a smarter, he's a pretty smart guy, well-grounded, it's an opinion. Analyst organization, this is again um, Forrester person, reported that these were the results of Agile at this la last year. This is excellent. But if I'm a business, what is better business IT alignment? Did we get more value from that or do they like each other better or what's, what does that mean? Um, improved quality, but I heard we're getting too much quality. Are our customers happier? You know, these things aren't satisfying. If this were a meal, I would be hungry, right? So we have this type of information um, being gathered by experts, being gathered by analysts, um, being gathered by consultants, and it's all anecdotal. It's all circumstantial. None of it talks about whether Agile is worth keeping or not, whether the values and principles have provided something worth keeping or not. All we have is a bunch of thoughts. This is another one, Standish Group, saying that Agile produces more success than Waterfall. Well, that's kind of interesting, except success is defined by all the requirements by the date for the cost. Huh, okay, so that one's irrelevant. Um, this one, favorite of mine by my friend Jeff Sutherland, he tends to love velocity. And so he's talking about 35% improvement in velocity, um, 300 to 400% increases, 1,680%, 450%, 50 times faster. And I'm like, if this is true, there are no jobs left in software development. You know, two people in a basement do it all. So I look at this and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't see any reason to keep investing in Agile. They tell me not to interrupt the team because that's not a good thing in Agile, but I don't believe that stuff. So state of Agile right now, and why someone should respect it and pursue it, is unknown. There is literally no one who can tell you what business value Agile has created for businesses in the last 10 years that wasn't there before. I showed you a lot of anecdotal things. I showed you a lot of circumstantial evidence. You know, we looked at things, we cheered, we drank a beer, but there's nothing where if someone started eroding it and saying, well, you know, use a methodology, it's no big deal. You know, what the heck, let's use some more tools. You don't have to really think this through. There's nothing that says, well, if we do that, how will that compare to when we were actually doing this according to the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto? There's no, nothing we can compare. And that's not a good situation because um, you have no ground to stand on. Everything we know, this is again, assertion or opinion, and I searched high and low, and believe me, standing in front of you is one of the best bullshitters in the industry. <laughs> I have asserted all sorts of things. And I'll tell you, it was all subjective. It was all based on circumstantial evidence, feel, opinion. Um, nothing where I could say to the business, you change this and it's going to be worse. And they'll say, how? You want to come in, you want a new set of practices and tools for DevOps. It's a great thing. They're going to say, how is it going to make things better? Well, you don't want things to get worse, do you? Well, that's not exactly you know, a compelling argument. So we ran into something about a year and a half ago that's been used in medicine for 20 years. 
and it's called evidence-based practices. And what they were starting to see in medicine, and this does relate to this, so bear with me for a little bit, um, is um, a lot of doctors were making diagnoses based on gut feel, what the drug detail man who just visited their office told them, what they heard from other doctors, and since they had left medical school and residency and internship, they hadn't actually been following up on what things were really going on. And so they were just doing the best they can, particularly if you're getting, seeing you know, 50 patients a day, you don't have a lot of times to really look at things. And what was bothering the medical community was a lot of misdiagnoses were being made, a lot of lawsuits were occurring, a lot of the medical care was getting more expensive. And so they decided that if they could help the doctors, the physicians, make diagnoses based on evidence of what they were seeing, what the best treatment was, and what the likely outcomes were so they could track it, that would be profoundly helpful. Unfortunately, there were computers to help do this. And so now, if you're a doctor, you're able to look up types of symptoms, you're able to look at probable diagnoses, you can look at variables in the diagnoses and come up with out outcomes, you're able to see who you can call to talk to, and you can be able to track follow-ups because they've been accumulating evidence about everyone who's been doing this, and they've been scrubbing that evidence and statistically analyzing it and building a database, you know, big data, about best practices in medicine and medical practice. And this has profoundly improved um, medical practice in the United States. This is called um, evidence-based practice. About um, back 2008, 2009, um, the thought came up that maybe there's a possibility called evidence-based management. Rather than making decisions based on gut feel, what a vendor tells you, panic and strike that's striking at that moment, if a manager could, particularly in software development or in business, could make a decision based on solid, direct evidence of likely outcomes, they could be better off than if they were doing it based on just opinions and hearsay and other things. And he said, kind of like, well, if it worked for medicine, it can work for us. Now, of course, there are some things that aren't parallel there, because in medicine, you know, you're dealing with a live body, or maybe a dead body, but with software, you're dealing with something that's not even visible. You know, and there is no school of management that's uniform, so it's a bit different. But the idea is, let's base our decisions based on direct evidence. Let's ignore circumstantial evidence, except as how it impacts the direct evidence. So evidence-based um, practice, 20 years, been used a lot. Um, and this ties together for medical community, patient values, best evidence, and clinical expertise to every situation. And for evidence-based management, this is again for managers trying to get some direct evidence to them so they can make decisions about what to do based on solid information that they can rely on then and in the future. So if someone wants to sell you DevOps, you can either ask for evidence that, that it's proven, you know, that it works, that's based on a lot of studies that have been done, and or you can try it in one small part of your organization and see what the difference is between that and what you have. And you can actually make decisions based on reality. Wow, that'd be kind of weird. So what it does, what this evidence-based management does, is it determines the value of an organization to an organization of its software development organization. So I could take two different organizations, and if they were in the same industry and had similar characteristics, I could look and see which one were getting more value from its software development organization. Hmm. And if I were in charge of one of those software development organizations and I took some actions to try to make it better, I could see whether it had a positive impact on the value it delivered to the business or not. That would be comforting. And what we've, what we've constructed is um, this model for direct evidence of software development's value to a business. And the first thing is, is um, just very, very simple. It is the value of that um, company right now in the marketplace, not of software. Most companies get most of their value through use of software, so it's 
tends to be a pretty good um, source. This is its current value. Now, current value is not enough to make decisions on because um, I come from Boston. We had Polaroid, we have DEC, we have Wang. We have all sorts of companies that were creating great revenues and also, right? So if I were a venture capitalist, I wouldn't be making my decisions based on you know, direct revenue or direct value right then. So the other two things that count on the organization sustainability is its ability to bring things to market. So time to market of new products and new ideas. If you can do that, you're likely to have been able to sustain revenue if you have a brain in your head is pretty good. The other type of thing is, and this counts on the brain in your head, is your ability to innovate. So what is your organization's ability to innovate? So ability to innovate and then bring it to a market and then the revenues that it's delivering. If I know these and I fire half of my developers, I send them to Sri Lanka and I can see this go down, I have some pretty good evidence that that was a dumb move. Right now, you don't have any evidence. All you know is you saved a bunch of money. Your company's going out of business, another issue. So we're using these three groupings, domains of direct evidence for the value that, um, just went the wrong way, the value that a software organization can bring to a business. And this is a, a radar graph of the values in there. So we have things like um, the innovation rate. What is that? Of your IT department or your product development organization's budget, how much of it is used for new development? How much has to be spent on maintenance? Well, because if it's a lot on maintenance, there goes a lot of your ability to innovate. Um, your employee satisfaction. If that's pretty low, you're going to have an issue even though your revenues are high now because your employees are leaving. Um, something like the usage index of your software, how much of it is used less than 50% of the time. You know, these are all direct, measurable things that are, you can't fiddle around with and yet have a direct impact on the value of that business. Um, and we have other ones, installed version index. This is a big deal with SAP. No one wanted to install their software, so most of their customers were four releases back. Hard to compete in that situation. Um, cycle time. If a customer has a desperate, desperate thing that they want to get into the software so they can use it, how long does it take for just that small piece of functionality to get in? Release cycle time. How long, what's the average time for a release of software? Stabilization rate. When I get done and I say code complete, what percent of the release is then spent making it so we can actually use that software? You know, so all these things are things which are easily measurable and have a direct impact on that organization's ability to be valuable and create value in the marketplace. So we're using these as measures of value. And what I do suspect, unfortunately haven't measured, is if you're in an agile organization, these are probably pretty good. And if you're an organization that's in kind of agile, these are probably not as good, but I don't know. We also take these and we combine them into something that's called an agility index, you know, one number, scale of 0.1 to 99, which relates um, the, the merge or the meld of these numbers. The current value is given a weight that's much higher than time to market and um, ability to innovate, and they're pulled together into one number and you can look at that and see, watch it go up and down overall with things weighed between each other. You can look at that and compare it to another company in the same um, standard industry code, same size. You can get a sense of, ooh, that's not good. You can watch trends in this. You know, I invest in something and my goodness, it got better, but these other three things got worse. It had another impact that I didn't notice. So again, we're watching a map of things that have value to the business, and we're seeing how they're changing. Matter of fact, if you change nothing, which is kind of hard to do, you'll find these changing anyway. But if you're a manager, this means you now have something to think about. Over on the right side is what we call circumstantial evidence in our software development organization. And that relates to, you know, like circumstantial evidence might be a burn down chart. That's circumstantial. It might mean that we're going to get something to the market sooner. Mm, not if our stabilization cycle's huge, but you know, it's a piece of evidence which 
could indicate that. And there are a lot of pieces of circumstantial evidence in our software development areas. Um, we have our people, different levels of skill, knowledge, and understanding. We have the practices we use for quality, the practices we use for development, the practices we use for um, process. We have all these things, and they all interact with each other. If I measure any one of them or any group of them, the likelihood of them not being impacted within the next five minutes by a bunch of the other ones is pretty low. So these, this circumstantial evidence is good. Um, if we want to do something to improve it, we can change, we can improve something like, we just got rid of all of your offices, sorry, you're now open space, and we can look and see what the impact of that is on the value that we deliver to the business. Just lost half our employees. We can then go back and diagnose, we can look in the circumstantial evidence and see what was likely to have caused that. Just like in evidence-based practices in medicine, we can accumulate data which says, given these sets of and groups of um, circumstantial evidence, practices and people, we're finding that we reach these values with these numbers. And so you can start getting standard deviations and you start doing, getting some statistics about this so we can talk about things based on experience and data rather than on opinion. If I see another article on, is TDD good, I'm going to throw up. No, I already did. Um, really nice to actually be able to look and see, um, based on the other types of circumstantial evidence that tie to that, how it affects things. And it'd be very nice to be able to do that, not with, you can certainly do that with just the data of how one organization develops software, but if you amalgamate that with the day, similar data from other organizations, you can start looking for patterns. And you can start looking for evidence of what are the best things to do to build software to create value for businesses in certain industries. We don't have that now, do we? Well, it feels good. You could even do something like this. I mean, people with numbers just get carried away. So here's one which talks about the amount invested in whatever agility is. So review one, two, and three, these are months apart. So one on the left is the amount invested, and the other is the cumulative. Then review two, we invested a little more, so Q went up. In review three, we invested a little more, and total went up. And you can see that that has an impact on release frequency. It came down. Other things may have caused it too, but came down. Um, release stabilization, whoa, that's hardly changed at all. If our intention was to do this to increase, to get better release stabilization time, oops, um, we did, though, get better time for cycle time for ability to get a single piece of software through, so that's good. You know, but this is your ability to assess the impact of what you do rather than just say, well, that salesman, you know, they treated me with respect, and I really appreciate that, so I'm going to buy this software because they say, Back when, before most of you were born, I'm with a salesman in an office, and this is at um, Lockheed Martin, he's saying, this will improve your productivity by 16% per developer. And the IT manager said, well, given all the other improvements I've gained and bought over the last couple of years, we should have no developers at all then, right? Because <laughs> everyone's claiming, never trust a salesman to tell you how much benefit you're gonna get. Wow. Remind me not to use that button again. <laughs> so goals. This is a program that um, I'm pursuing for, for a very simple reason. Faith and belief. I have faith, I have belief that the values and the principles in the Agile Manifesto create an enabled, creative, positive work phrase the workforce that can create the sort of software and products that are needed by our growing, increasingly populated society. And I believe that we are in trouble if that isn't true. So I'm hoping that this type of evidence, one, proves that Agile is better than 
waterfall or other things, that'd be good. Um, if not, we won't hear from you again. Um, and that if, we, if that does prove that people can have a benchmark to make decisions against, that they can continue to get more and more value from their software development organizations. That their decisions are informed, and at least if they aren't informed, they have a quick feedback on whether that was good or bad. So what I'm hoping for is that we can start making some better investments, generate more business value, avoid wasting energy on fads, and be able to evaluate whether something's helping create value or not. And we can create an evidence-based profession you know, where there's data to support what most of us know in our heart is a good way to work. So, one, the bad news, the state of agility is unknown. And I'll tell you, it wouldn't be eroded and corrupted and being fadized if that weren't true. Weren't true. Software is too important to our society for that to continue. That evidence-based management can determine the value your organization gets from software. And this is not a big deal. It's gathering data and looking at it and making decisions on it, and it's not a lot of data. You can do this in several days in a business functional area in an organization. It's not a big deal. You may not like what you see, but you know it's very valuable. And the last thing is just promise. If Agile is more productive than Waterfall, um, I will be here next year, and hopefully I'll have a lot of data to share with you, and we'll be able to talk about what it means and how things worked. So this is um, a pretty big initiative. Um, this is bringing something to um, our profession that I never thought was overdue, but apparently is. I had never thought, I thought, you know, the right thing to do was apparent. No, it's not. And so this is bringing us into modern practices. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? Um, there's drinks and all that coming up in some minutes, so. Yes? So, this probably is this for Agile, does it make this for any other methodology that you would follow? If this exists for Agile, doesn't this apply to any other methodology? Yes. Um, Big bank, they're still using Waterfall to build, run their legacy systems. Let's see how you're doing with that. Um, so this is perfect for, and it's process agnostic, it's tool agnostic. It simply measures for um, a context of software development, how much value they're delivering to the business and the circumstantial evidence about why. I've been using the word value a lot. And we defined it with some metrics, right? Um, Bart Murphy read off some questions to you first thing in the morning at lunch, saying that we were going to award a prize to the person who, in the absence of this information, was best able to define value. So who do you think that was? Hmm. Let's hope they're here. Let's hope they're here. Let's hope they're here. Cheng Zhao from Nationwide. Hi. You are a terse, precise person. Can you read your definition? Uh, my definition for the value is to deliver the competi competitive advantage and the strength to the organization. Strength to the organization. Yeah. So that goes really to all three legs of value. Yes. 
Thank you very much. You did well. Thank you. Thank you. He, um, I know that he wants to play rugby. It's in everyone's heart, you know, to get the piss beaten out of them. <laughs> There's your rugby ball to go do it. And here's a uh, seminal book on evidence-based management, Hard Facts, Dangerous Half-Truths and Total Nonsense. Use this well. Thank you very much. Do I take some questions? I can. <laughs> We're going to be um, down in the drink place. <laughs> If we remain coherent, if I remain coherent, if you remain coherent, we can talk more there. Um, we have some overview information on this. Um, if you want to get it, it's just a short, like, 11-page um, document. Um, hope this works. No reason it shouldn't. See you next year. While we open, sorry. Well, we open up. Does anybody have any questions? We'll take you know a couple questions and then we'll close down the session. Does anybody have any questions? May raise your hand so we can find you. Oh, we got one over here. Hold on. It's not 4:30 yet. Come on. Bar doesn't open till 4:30. So. Sorry. Hopefully, I can formulate my question the right way. But in the talk that you just gave, you, you seem to be making a very clear distinction between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Yes. And you seem to be insinuating that circumstantial evidence doesn't have any value to it. And even in, in court cases, that's what, when you go to court, you go mostly with circumstantial evidence, but what you try to do is you try to corroborate that evidence by testimony. Yep. In the absence of direct evidence, a good person will gather as much circumstantial evidence as possible. So if you attack it from one point of view, it's corroborated from another point of view, corroborated from another point of view. Um, we could do that, except there are so many variables, interactions of them in software development that it makes um, corroborating evidence that a crime scene looked pretty trivial. So we thought about that for a long time and decided that was not the path to go. Yeah. Well, I think we're actually, we'll, 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 we'll stop the session now and uh, we'll take, uh, again, scrum.org will be down at the retrospective if people have uh, follow-up questions or want to talk EBM with any of those folks. Uh, thank you for coming, and we'll see everybody down at the retrospective. If you haven't done your card yet, please put in your card at the, out of the side of the door. I'm going to pick it up in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>